Hello and welcome back. Today we'll watch to maybe around 40 minutes in this how to speak lecture. And I think I'm a bit different today than I was compared to how I was yesterday. There are some things I have to get to. I should organize myself first. One of them is uh, make a blog post on how I did um, a joke comparison project. More on that maybe in a future video. Uh, all right. Next is maybe do something with GANs. I spilled this soda yesterday, and um, now there's an there's ants all over my room. Very annoying. Oh uh, goodness. It was like this horrible tasting um, ginger beer, which is not beer, by the way. And um, essentially, it tastes like more gingery than ginger ale. So essentially, that means it tastes horrible. I should try to put cinnamon on my floorboards to keep the ants away. Uh, all right, I'll put a timestamp in my video, basically skipping to the part where we actually start the lecture. So right now I'm just kind of recapping my day. Anyway, the reason that the soda spilled is because it tasted so bad that I kind of just drank half of it and then I left it on the edge of my desk and then one, uh, one turn and it was all over. <laughs> Oh, also, I taught uh, I taught chemistry, so I should probably tell my chemistry teacher about that. And then, let's see. I think my English teacher may have called me fruity, which I have not found the exact definition for. It seems like, uh, on a scale of one to ten, I would say it's about a four in terms of the connotation where one is negative and ten is positive so that's not reassuring i am actually trying to get uh, some sort of humanities teacher to write me a letter of recommendation and that made me very unsure uh, of who i should ask anyway let's see uh, so I should send an email to my chem teacher. What else happened? Oh, right. My team won the um, Federal Reserve Challenge for high schoolers. So we're going to get our podcast script published in a journal. Journal of Future Economists. Very prestigious for myself. And I don't really have any other rewards, so that's good for me. Uh, now, let us begin the video. This is, um, he's about to show the prop. Another example I like to uh, remember is one from when I was taking 801. Alan Lazarus was the instructor at the time, and he was talking about the conservation of energy, okay. kinetic and potential. This might be him spinning around. I did a long wire in the ceiling in 26100. Uh, is he going to do the thing where he makes the... I think he's going to do the thing where he makes the ball like um, swing from a pendulum starting from his face. And then it's not going to hit his nose. And he's going to be like, I wasn't scared at all. Here's a steel ball, but one not unlike this. And Lazarus uh, took the ball up against a wall like this, he put his head tight against the wall to steady himself, and then uh, he let go, and the pendulum takes many seconds to go. Would have been funny if he let go right there. And then uh, gently uh, kisses Lazarus's nose. And so you have many seconds to think, this guy really believes in the conservation of energy. <laughs> um, do not try this at home. <laughs> the problem is that uh, first time you do this, you may not just let go. There's a 
natural human tendency to push. <laughs> so uh, that's a, a little bit uh, on the subject of props. That actually had nothing to do with um, what he was saying. I guess it's um, kind of illustrating how captivating you know, it can be. It's interesting. Whenever surveys are taken... So I, I guess I changed my mind again. It does have something to do with um, what he's talking about. Students always say more chalk, less PowerPoint. And uh, why would that be? Uh, props are always also very effective. Why would that be? Uh, I'll give you my uh, lunatic fringe view on this. It uh, has to do with uh, what I would call M. Empathetic. Empathetic mirroring. When you're sitting up there watching me right on the board, all those little mirror neurons in your head, I believe, become actuated and you can feel yourself writing on the blackboard. And even more so, uh, when I uh, talk about this uh, steel ball going that way and this way, you, you can, you can, you can mm. feel the ball as if you were me. And you can't do that with a, with a slide. You can't do it with a picture. That makes sense. You need sense. to see it uh, in, in a physical world. That's why I think that, oh yes, of course, it's, it's, there, there are speed questions involved too that have to be separated out, but I think the empathetic mirroring is why. Uh, I think for the speed he's talking about how the speed at which um, someone can write words on the blackboard is the same speed that people think at as compared to just flipping a bunch of slides. That's a lot faster than people can process. Props and the use of a blackboard uh, are so effective. Oh, right. I was teaching uh, how to do some organic chem compound naming. And basically, um, I think I did a decent job of making some jokes throughout. But um, I would rate my performance as about a 5, which is worse than the average score, 5.5, .5 on a scale of 1 to 10. So, uh, I think I have a lot to improve on, but I did apply some principles like repeat as well as using the whiteboard. Well, let's see. Oh yes, there is uh, one more thing by way of uh, the tools, and that has to do with... Oh, I didn't ask any questions though, but... The students have had plenty of questions themselves, so I don't know uh, if that was good or bad. But the time and place was actually well lit and populated, and it was 11 a.m., so it was an 11 a.m. class, I think. The uh, use of slides. I repeat. I think they're for exposing ideas, not for teaching ideas, but that's what we do in a job talk or a conference uh, talk. We expose ideas, we don't teach them. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, my views on that. Um, I remember once I was... Um, I'm now thinking back to uh, when I was at Sam's. I wasn't at Carnegie Mellon, but basically... Um, it was the science, what was it? I think it was biomedical devices class. Basically, it was just a professor giving a lecture uh, using a PowerPoint over Zoom. And it was really, really boring. I cannot describe how boring it was, but um, basically I think that's an example of what happens when there's an over-reliance on slides. And it probably would have been better in person because uh, the addition of the screen factor, I think it's a lot worse than just having slides. Although that might not be true.
Let's continue with his story. In um, Terminal A at Logan Airport, I just come back from a really miserable conference and the flight was Somewhere really horrible. Somewhere. It was one of those that feels like an unbalanced washing machine. And for the only time in my life, I decided to uh, stop on my way to my car and uh, have a... What's the difference between an unbalanced and balanced washing machine? Or whatever is inside. A cup of coffee and relax a little bit. And I, as I was there for a few minutes, uh, someone came up to me and said, uh, Are you Professor Winston? I think so, I said. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I was trying to be funny. In any event, uh, he said, I'm on my way to Europe to give a job talk. Would you mind uh, critiquing my slides? Not at all, I said. You have too many, and they have too many words. How did you know, he said, <laughs> thinking perhaps I'd seen a talk of his before. I hadn't. Uh, my reply was, because it's always true. There are always too many slides, always too many words. So let me show you some extreme examples of how not to use slides. Yeah, this is, this is the type of stuff I'm talking about. This is exactly um, what was going on at Sam's. Okay, let's see. Oh, by the way, uh, the math course at Sam's, that was um, a lot less slidey because essentially... Well, math is math, right? It's all on the blackboard, so definitely more engaging. And as a presenter, I think the professor did a better job. Let me see. Basic crimes. Let me just read this slide real quick. <laughs> People in your friends. What is read your what is a transparency? Far away. Hmm. Goofy clip art. Background pattern. Well, for this demonstration, I need to be uh way over here. These are good tips. Um, and uh, when I get over here, uh, then I can start to say things like, uh, uh, one of the things you shouldn't do is read your transparencies. People in your audience know how to read and read. I think the transparencies are just um, Also, you should no be sure that you have only a few words on each transparency and that the words are, are easy to read. And I hope they're driving you crazy because I'm committing uh, all kinds of crimes. The first of which is that there are too many words on the slide. Second of which is I'm way over there, and the slide's way over there. So you get into this uh, tennis match feeling of uh, shifting back and forth between the slide and the speaker. You want the slides to be uh, condiments to what you're saying, not the main event or the opposite way around. So uh, how can we fix this? Step number one is to get rid of the background junk. That's always distraction. Uh, step number two is to get rid of the words. When I reduced uh, the words to these, then everything I read a previous time, I'm not licensed to say because it's not on the slide. I'm not reading my slides anymore, but I'm saying what was written on the slides in a previous uh, example. So what else can we do to simplify this? Well, we can get rid of the logos. We don't need them. Simplification. What else can we do? Get rid of the title. Now I want to talk to you about some rules for slide preparation. I'm telling you the title. It doesn't have to be up there. Mm, By reducing no the number title. of words on the slide, I'm allowing you to pay more attention to me. I actually think that titles might be helpful, but I guess if it's like not just something to look at, then the titles are unnecessary. And most of what's I see where slide. he's coming from though. If it's like a lecture. I mentioned it before, we have only no one language processor and we can either use it to read stuff or to listen to the speaker. And so if we have too many words on the slide, if 
forces people in the audience to read his stuff and not listen. A student of mine did an experiment a few years ago. Uh, he taught some students some um, web-based programming ideas. Half the information was on slides. He said the other half. And then for a control group, he reversed it. And the question was, what did the subjects, that is to say, freshmen in his fraternity, what did the subjects remember best? What he said or what they read on the slide? And the answer is what they read on the slide. When their slides have a lot of material on it, they don't pay attention to the speaker. In fact, in the after action report, one of the subjects said, I wish you hadn't talked so much. It was distracting. <laughs> Well, the last item is eliminate clutter. Now, here's some clutter. No, re no, no reason even for those bullets. So the too many words problem is the consequence of uh, a crime Microsoft has uh, committed by allowing you to use uh, fonts that are too small. So you should all have a sample slide like this that you can use to determine what the minimum font size is that's, that's easily legible. Shiru, what do you think? Of those. Which size, which size is right? What's that? Did you calculate which size is right? Yeah. This Minimum, maybe. 40 or 50? Yeah, he says 40 or 50. I think it's about right. 35 is if you can get too small. Not necessarily because you can't read it, but because, it, because you're probably <laughs> using it to get too many words on the slide. <laughs> what other crimes do we have? Well, we have the laser pointer crime. <laughs> and for that, I really want. You know, in the old days, when we didn't have laser pointers, we used wooden ones, and people would go waving these things around. And Is he going to point at something? Pretty soon it became almost like a, a time twirling contest. So here's what, here's what I recommended in the old days for dealing with oh, this no. kind of pointer. This example of the use of a prop. <laughs> Jim Glass up there uh, saw this talk about 20 years ago and uh, said, oh yeah, I remember that talk. That's the one where you broke the pointer. <laughs> it's amazing how props uh, tend to be the things that are remembered. Well now, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, physical pointers anymore. We've got, uh, we've got laser pointers. That's a wonder more people aren't driven into epileptic fits over this sort of stuff. But here's what tends to happen. Look at that, it's a lovely recursive picture and I can become part of it by putting that laser beam right on the back of my head up there. That's quite interesting. <laughs> and what do you see? You see the back of my head. I'm not, I'm, I have no eye contact, no engagement, nothing. I was sitting uh, with a student uh, watching a talk one day, and she said, you know what? We could all leave, and he wouldn't know. <laughs> so what happens when you use now. a laser pointer? You can't use a laser pointer without turning your head and pointing it at something. And when you do that, you lose, uh, you lose contact with the audience. You, you don't want to do it. Yeah, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of students a lot of, especially freshmen, actually, um, they just kind of do stuff. It's kind of like a game. It's kind of like don't get caught by the warden. It's like cops and robbers, essentially, or um, red light, green light. It's like when they turn around, you uh, you do some crazy stuff, like throw something across the room or uh, try to like eat something. I don't know, something like that. But basically, it's like. When the teacher turns uh, his or her head away, that's when uh, the crazy stuff happens. So what do you do if you need to, uh, need to identify something in your image and you don't want to point at it with a laser? This is what you do. Put a little arrow on there and say, now look at that guy number one at the end of arrow number one. You don't need to have a laser pointer to do that. Hmm, the arrow. The too heavy crime. When people uh, ask me to review a presentation, I ask them to print it out and lay it out on a table. 
Mm. When they do that, it's easy to see whether the talk is too heavy, too much text, not enough air, not enough uh, white space, not enough imagery. Interesting. This is a good example of uh, such a talk. Way too heavy. I remember seeing a lot of these actually, uh, as many of you might feel the same way. I think it was during um, last year, I was in US history class, and at the end of the year, we were doing some sort of presentation or podcast, something like that. And there was one group who made a really long, like 100 slide presentation. And that person is more suited to write uh, long garbage essays that no one wants to read. Let's continue. Uh, the the uh, presenter has taken advantage of uh, small font sizes to get as much on the slide as he wanted. Mm. Lots of other crimes here, but uh, the, the too heavy, the fact that it's too heavy is what I want. Yeah, all these rules, rules about the margin, these don't actually matter. Uh, or like the page number and where to put the title in the center, things like that. These things don't matter if you don't have that much text on your page. To illustrate. So here, by contrast, uh, another talk, one I gave a few years ago. It's not a, it wasn't a deeply technical talk, but I show it to you because there's <laughs> air in it. It's mostly pictures of things. There are three or four slides that have text on them. I think my chemistry teacher does this very well. He kind of likes to pull up images of whatever he's going to make an analogy about. Like one time, I remember distinctly, there was, um, I think it was a species of worm, some sort of pet parasitic worm. And the story was that someone ate a whole jar of them or drank a whole jar of them in high school, when he was in high school. Uh, I don't actually remember what that lesson was, but the imagery is what really matters. Another time I think there was, um, he pulled up like a rover and then he said, well, one of my past students actually worked on this. So I don't know what the point of that was, but I definitely remember it as well. Uh, it, the most recent example was when he pulled up a picture of an old miner's hat, like as in someone who digs for stuff in the ground. And when he went caving, which is when you go into caves as a college student, um, he actually did the, he actually used those hats with the candles inside of them with the chemical reaction that he taught us about. I think it was something like HCCH. It was a triple bonded C in the middle and an H on either side. I don't remember what the chemical is called, but definitely an interesting combustion. But when I come to those, I give the audience time to read them. And they're there because they might have some historical significance. The first slide with a lot of text on it is an extraction from the 1957, from the, for the, from the proposal for the 1957 AI conference at Dartmouth. Extraordinarily interesting event and that historical extraction from the proposal helps drive that point home. What else have we got here? Oh yeah, your vocabulary word for the day. This is an Apex Legomenon. Hmm. What that means is this is the kind of slide you can get away with exactly once in your presentation. This is a slide that I got some currency some years ago because it shows the complexity of um, governing in Afghanistan by showing how impossibly <coughs> complex it is. It's something we, you and, and the audience can't understand, and, and that's <laughs> the point. But you can't have many of these. You can have one per work, one per presentation, one per paper, one per book. That's what it, that's what Apex Legomenon is, and this is an example of it. Well, I've shown you some crimes, and so you might be asking, do these crimes actually occur? So um, they do. <laughs> There's the hands in the pockets crime. There's a um, 
crime and time and place selection here. This is how you get to the Bartos Theater. First thing you do is you get down these steps over at the Media Lab. Then you cross this large open space. Then you turn right down this corridor. <laughs> at this point, whenever I go in there, I wonder if, if there are torture implements around the corner. <laughs> and then when you get in there, you get into this dark, gloomy place. So it's well named when, when they call it the Bartos Theater because it's a place where you can watch a movie, but it's not a place where you can give a talk. Mm. Now, on a subject that doesn't happen, here's a talk uh, I attended a while back in Stata. Notice that the speaker is uh, far away from the slides. The speaker's <coughs> using a laser pointer. And you say to me, well, what's happening here? It's, by the way, the 80th, 80th slide in the presentation. Notice that it's dense with words. This is the first of 10 conclusion slides. <laughs> so uh, what's the audience reaction? That's the sponsor of the meeting. He's reading his email. This is the co-sponsor of the meeting. He's examining the lunch menu. <laughs> what about this person? This person looks like he's paying attention. Now he's using the arrows to call people out again. So very interesting use of uh, his own techniques. But just because it's a still picture, if you were to see a video, what you would see is something like this. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, uh, it does happen. Well now, uh, that's a, a, a quick review of, uh, of tools. Now I want to talk about some special cases. We could talk a little bit about uh, informing, or to say it another way, doing what I'm doing now. But I'll just say a few words about that. Uh, in, that kind of, in that kind of presentation, you want to start with a promise, like I did for this, for this, uh, for this hour that we're going through now. But then it comes to the question of how do you inspire people? Inspire. I've given this talk for a long time, and a few years ago, uh, so he has been doing this uh, for our a year. department chairman said, would you please uh, give this talk to uh, a new faculty and be sure to emphasize what it takes to inspire students. And uh, strangely, I hadn't thought about that question before, so I started a survey. I talked to some of my incoming freshman advisees, and I talked to senior faculty and everything in between about how they've been inspired. What I found from the uh, incoming freshmen is that they were inspired by some high school teacher who told them they could do it. What I found in the senior faculty, they um, were inspired by someone who helped them to see a problem in a new way. And what I saw from everyone is that they were inspired when someone exhibited passion about what they were doing exhibit passion about what they are doing. Yeah, so Very that's um, that's one, one way to be inspiring. It's easy for me because, you know, I do artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, how, how, how can you not be interested in artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> I mean, if you're not interested in artificial intelligence, you're probably not interested in interesting things. <laughs> so uh, when I'm lecturing uh, in my AI class, it's natural for me to talk about what I think is cool and how exciting some new idea is. Uh, yeah. So that's the, kind of, that's the kind of expression of passion that makes a difference so I guess this also uh, depends while informing on with respect to this question of, uh, of, of inspiring. Oh yeah, and of course uh, during this uh, promise phase you can also express how cool stuff is. Let me give you an example of uh, a lecture that starts this way. Uh, I'm talking about resource allocation. Uh, it's the same sort of stuff you would think of when you're, so it's, it's the same sort of ideas you would need if you're allocating uh, aircraft to a flight schedule or trying to schedule a factory or something like that. But the example is uh, putting colors on the states in the United States without any bordering states having the same color. So here it goes. This is what I show in the beginning of the class. 
This is a way of doing that coloring. And you might say, well, why don't we wait till it finishes? Would you like to do that? No? Mm. <clears throat> well, we're not going to wait till it finishes because the sun will have exploded and consumed the earth before this program finishes. <laughs> but with a slight adjustment to how the program works, which I tell my students, you will understand in the next 50 minutes, this is what you should. Isn't that cool? You know, you got you got to be the, you got to be amazed by stuff that takes a computation from. Yeah, I think this is related to the um, the four color problem. Whether you can color something with only four colors. Uh, I have a book on it, but I never read it. But I do have some sense of you know graph coloring. Uh, all right, let's continue. Longer than the lifetime of the solar system. Well, I think his point here is that you can build up anticipation and use that for a promise at the beginning, something like that. In a few seconds. So that's just one way of using it. Though, so that's what I mean by providing a promise up front and expressing some passion about what. Yeah, so he is talking about the promise. You're talking about. Okay, it's uh, it's forty, forty. Oh no. All right. Um, yeah, I think this was very insightful. Uh, and I guess that's the end of this video. I'll see you guys next time. I don't like this section as much as the previous one, though. Because maybe I wasn't paying attention. Maybe I just found the previous part more interesting. Because uh, it was better? I don't know. More captivating. But yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you guys for watching and see you guys next time.